It is a great time to be a space fan. We have not one, but two lunar landers being built for the Artemis program. First, the ambitious Starship by SpaceX for the Artemis 3 and 4 missions. And second, Blue Origin and the national team with their lander for Artemis 5. But is one of them better than the other? Let's compare both landers, dive into the similarities and differences and determine if we need both and if they are on time for their missions. As you probably all know, Blue Origin initially competed against SpaceX in the Human Landing System contract in which SpaceX won the bid for Artemis 3. At this point, SpaceX is under contract to perform the landings for Artemis 3 and Artemis 4. The lander, Mark II, who was now selected for this mission, can bring up to four astronauts to the lunar surface and support them there for up to 30 days in a fully reusable configuration. The cargo variant of this lander will be able to bring 20 tons in reusable and 30 tons in a one-way configuration. The whole infrastructure will be based on hydrogen and oxygen, which might be one of the make or break points of the lander. Remember with SLS, hydrogen can be complicated. It requires to be very cold, it can leak very easily, and it needs a lot of insulation. Blue says the high specific impulse of LOX LH2 provides a dramatic advantage for high energy deep space missions. Nevertheless, lower performing but more easily storable propellants have been favored for these missions because of the problematic boil off of LOX LH2 during their long mission timelines. This is one of the bigger challenges that could arise during the development of the lander, making sure the hydrogen stays in place. But also, refueling it, more on that later, could be challenging with the extra slippery fuel. The one advantage Blue has here is the fact that they already work with hydrogen, used on their new Shepard vehicle. Yes, this is not even close to being comparable to a new Glenn upper stage or a new orbit refueling. But at least they are going in not completely blind. But it's not all bad news for Blue. Let's move to some things that promise a bright future and where they are really good at. Infrastructure. Blue continues constructing an impressive campus at the Cape for their new Glenn rocket. More and more hardware of the rocket is being spotted at the Cape, which promises some good advancement on the rocket for their lander. At the pad, we have seen rings, test tanks, pathfinders and transport director tests. Furthermore, Blue has an impressive facility for first and second stage testing at the Cape, where they can prepare upcoming new Glens. Yeah, the rocket has yet to start flying, but Blue will build the infrastructure to scale it once it does. With its current debut being planned for 2023, and even if we can include several slips, New Glenn will likely be not on the critical path for 2029 readiness. Signs point to a 24-25 New Glenn flying, so let's hope for that. Part of this infrastructure will also be the buildings to develop hardware for the lander. Even though we have not yet heard confirmation where the final lander will be built, facilities at the Cape will likely work on it as this will be the launch center for the lander. Initially, Blue Origin tried to mock SpaceX for having a lander that needed refueling. Well, theirs also will be refueled. The Cislunar Transporter, a reusable tanker built by Lockheed Martin for this purpose, will be fueled in low Earth orbit before flying to the near rectilinear halo orbit to refuel the lander. So both landers of the program now need on-orbit storage and propellant transfer development. That's really exciting, but also a schedule risk. Let's look at the final part of this. Engines. BE4, the reusable Methalox engine will power New Glenn and ULH Vulcan. In the past, the engine has been a schedule slipper, with it constantly having problems or not reaching its final goals. But this time seems to be over. As BE4 will fly on ULA's Vulcan very soon, this confirms it is at least theoretically ready for flight. The only question after this remains is, could this engine also support multiple relights and the performance needed for New Glenn? As we sadly don't know if there's a significant difference in the configuration of both rockets using the engine. Time will tell, but it looks at least promising. Recently, ULA performed a successful flight readiness firing using the BE-4 engine below their Vulcan rocket. This means the engines are cleared to fly on the debut mission, 
which increases the confidence. We are most likely talking about the BE7 engine on the lander side. Blue confirmed in the past that the designated lunar engine had been fired, although we lack concrete updates on the timeline, success and confidence of these tests. Certainly one of the biggest unknowns. Let's move over to SpaceX, but before we do, time for today's sponsor. Thanks Adrian. I've had the same chunky George Costanza style leather wallet for over a decade. I love this wallet, but it's so huge and taking it in my pocket every time I sit down has gotten so annoying. I solved this with today's sponsor, Exter. Their wallets are about half the size of a conventional wallet but carry 12 cards and cash. You can gain access to your cards with the click of a button. Very neat. The wallets have built in RFID protection so people can't steal your data. Plus, they're made out of sustainable materials, both of which I really appreciate. I got a leather wallet because that's what I've always had. It has a nifty optional tracking card, which is great if you're like me and you lose your wallet all the time. I also got basically the same wallet, but it has AirTag support if you're an Apple person. Ultimately though, for my daily driver, I settled on the carbon fiber card holder. It's so light and tiny, it doesn't even register as being in my pocket. To get yours, visit shop.exter.com NSF or use code SPACE at checkout to get up to 35% off as part of their Father's Day sale, which ends June 20th. So go now. Thanks again to Exter for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to it. Okay, okay. Let's talk about the big rocket you're all here for, Starship. Starship performed its first integrated test flight in April of this year. Did it reach all of its goals? No. Was it exciting? Absolutely. We will not dive deep into the yes or no's on how successful this initial test flight was, but if you want to know more about that, here's an extra long video on that topic. So what's next for Starship in the context of being a lander for the Artemis program? Well, the infrastructure needs to reach orbit and it needs to reach it fast as Artemis 3 is way closer than Artemis 5. Right now the mission is planned for December 2025. It is not unlikely that we will see a slip into 2026, but even that only leaves SpaceX with three years to fully develop the HLS lander, test it, prove it and get it ready. That is a tight timeline. This also includes an uncrewed lunar demo, initially planned for 2023. This is very soon and the big question includes the rocket, life support systems and other HLS specific hardware. Just for context, three years is about the time between the explosion of the MK1 Starship prototype and the integrated flight test. Furthermore, SpaceX needs infrastructure. For example, a clean room or at least a closed and protected environment. It is unlikely that NASA will allow for the launch of a lander that was not built in a clean environment. So to support this, SpaceX will need not any clean environment, but an about 70 meter tall one. And with the launch taking place from the Cape, they most likely need it there. This could be part of the Roberts Road expansion, but we have not seen any plans for a Starship or HLS sized closed space yet. SpaceX is usually great at making infrastructure appear out of nowhere. The question is, will this infrastructure be enough for the stances of NASA? On the good side, in the past, SpaceX has proven over and over again that they can meet the high standards of the agency. But other Starship variants will be needed as well. To refuel and store the propellant, SpaceX needs to develop a special tanker and depot Starship that will be used to refuel for such missions. The same we said about Blue also is accurate for Starship. They need to develop the technology to transfer cryogenic fluids in space and do it even faster than the competition from the national team. What could help them is their hardware-rich approach. They have tons of Starship and boosters around. Once they figure out how to reach orbit with these, they could prepare such tankers and depots relatively quickly. So everything really depends on Starship flying successfully very soon. Let's talk about Raptor. which is a cornerstone of this infrastructure. Like BE4, Raptor is still in development and recently Elon confirmed some specs about the third generation of Raptor engines. The bottom line is, they test this engine a lot, but it needs to work soon. And hopefully we will not see multiple Raptor engines failing in a test flight again. We never got concrete confirmation of what exactly killed these engines. Still, the reliability needs to be there compared to the miracle that SpaceX made happen with the development of the super reliable Merlin engine. 
Once they figure it out, however, they already have a factory and complex testing structure and ready in McGregor to support pumping out these engines as fast as they need. They will also need lunar landing engines, as Raptor would likely create a crater, even throttled down. We need confirmation of the firings of this unknown lander engine or the exact landing they want to pursue, and it is, like BE7, a bit of a wild card. Come on SpaceX and Blue, give us some updates. Let's make this controversial. I will look at SpaceX and Blue regarding infrastructure, vehicle, engine and lander readiness and judge them based on what we know and my overall impressions. Let me know what you think in the comments. Infrastructure. SpaceX can quickly build infrastructure and we know that. But looking at the necessary cape structures at this moment, Blue has an impressive campus. With the launch pad for New Glenn being closer to ready than 39A4 Starship and the fact that Roberts Road is still in a very rough build state, I will give this first very controversial point to Blue Origin. Blue might be slightly ahead here. However, SpaceX might be the most fitting company in the world to close that gap of missing Cape infrastructure as fast as they could. They already built it once in Boca. Vehicle readiness. Here the point goes obviously to SpaceX. The integrated flight test did not fully succeed, but they have an integrated hardware on the stand. That is not the case for the new Glenn right now. A clear point for me. SpaceX having the vehicle in an almost ready state might be their biggest advantage for lander readiness. New Glenn might be further ahead than we know, but we just don't know. So hey Blue, please surprise me and roll out something cool. Engine readiness. This is a tie for me. On the one hand, SpaceX has a huge production facility for Raptors and tests them five times every day. On the other hand, Blue Origin has built a BE-4 that is good enough for ULA and ULA usually has high quality standards. The lunar engines are hard to judge as both companies are very silent about them, so it's hard to include them in the overall picture. Lander readiness. Here comes the big unknown into play. Both companies have yet to discuss their actual lander the needed critical systems and the life support. We all know they will need it, but we must find out where they are developing it. I will still give this point barely to SpaceX, as they have more experience with the critical infrastructure needed for space travel. Why? Because of Dragon. Dragon leads life support, shielding and more to work in space. So SpaceX did all of this already. Of course, flying to the moon is different than flying to Leo. But they have some experience. On the other hand, Blue Origin has only flown the suborbital New Shepard so far, which does not need complex radiation shielding and life support. Hence, a small point here and an overall advantage for SpaceX. Let me know if you agree with this or if I need to correct something. Let's close this with a note. Of course, it is fun to compare these landers, but in the end, both are part of the same venture, the Artemis program. A program that will bring us humans back to the moon and allow younger people, like me, to witness a moon landing for the first time in our life. Both excite and inspire me, and I'm happy we have both around. In this case, competition is good for everybody, as it ensures both companies want to develop the best product to get the edge in showing that their lander is the best. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you liked this piece about the lander. We will stay on top of Artemis news as humanity approaches a new moon lander. Would you like the same comparison with the US program versus China? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching.